Take your Bible, turn to Genesis 3. Genesis chapter 3. I could put that on the screen for you. I think I will. There we go. Genesis chapter 3, and then we'll move on from there. We're in a study of the book of Genesis. And we've made it all the way up to chapter 3, and we're learning about the nature of Satan, who he is, how he works, what he tries to do, what he can do, what he can't do. There's certain things he cannot do. And uh, we're, we're learning those from the scriptures. The Bible says so much about the devil and about those spirits, those devils that are under his authority he controls them he tells them this is what i want done and they go do it we know that there are evil angels we know there are unclean spirits familiar spirits uh different various types of devils so on and uh the chief of all of those of course is the serpent the dragon satan he's called lucifer and uh, we, we understand who that Lucifer is. The, that we, and we'll get into that tonight probably in Isaiah 14 where the only place in the Bible that actually uses the title Lucifer is in Isaiah 14. And we'll look into that a little bit and see what it means. But let's start out in Genesis chapter 3. Let's read uh, the first five verses and then we'll move sort of quickly through where we've been so far with this and get into where we're going tonight. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. We see that he's questioning God's word. He is the one who puts doubt in the minds of men about God's word. God didn't really say that. Men wrote that. Men invented that. Men wrote the Bible. Men came up with that and so on. He's the one that started that. Verse 2, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, she added to that, lest ye die. And the... The serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. Now he's contradicting God's word. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods, little g, knowing good and evil. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we ask your blessings on this day. This is your day. First day of the week, and you said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So, Father, we have laid aside this first day of the week in honor and respect and reverence to you and to your kingdom and to your word. And I pray, dear God, that you would bless us, prepare us, Father, for days to come. You see our future and we don't. So, Father, we have to follow you by faith. We have to go where you tell us to go, where you lead us to go. And Father, we just pray, dear God, that you would never let us go astray. Father, we ask, God, that you give us light and understanding concerning our enemy, how he works against us, how he works against our families, how he works against our nation, how he works against those who go to church, those who say they believe the Bible, how he, how he infiltrates churches, bringing in false doctrine, doctrines of devils. Give us understanding, give us wisdom, Father, so we don't fall for his lies like we used to. Father, hold on to us tight and always guide us and show us truth so we can have understanding of what's going on around us. We ask you, Father, Lord, that you would just protect us this week and keep us all safe. We pray, dear God, that 
those who are dealing drugs in this neighborhood, Father, Lord, you'd either save them or run them out. Pray, dear God, that angels would stand and guard over this place and watch over us and keep us all safe in here tonight. We love you. We put our trust in you and we ask for your kindness to us. Father, we don't ask for what we deserve. What we deserve is hell. We ask you, Father, for grace. Giving us things that we don't deserve. Father, we thank you for that and we'll praise you for all of eternity. Even more so than we are praising you tonight. Bless your word. Open up our hearts and our ears and our eyes and help us to be attentive tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. So, uh, 2 Corinthians 11. Let's turn there very quickly as I kind of move through this. Or you can look up on the screen. Uh, Paul then uses what, uh, was what Moses wrote in Genesis chapter 3 to illustrate this is, this is how the devil works. He said, Would to God you could bear with me a little of my folly and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Christ is the bridegroom, the husband, the church, all those who are saved, born again, are his bride. One of these days we will be with him as a husband and wife come together. But I fear lest by any means, and here's where he lays it out, as the serpent beguiled Eve. So as the serpent beguiled Eve is, go back and read Genesis 3 and look at how he did it. Um, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, this is what you got to watch out for. A fake Jesus. Fake, phony Jesus. Whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, a spirit that is not the Holy Spirit. So if you go into church and everybody is drunk, so-called, in that church, is that the Holy Spirit? No. God tells us to be sober. Be vigilant for your adversary the devil as a walketh about, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. If you're drunk, you're not going to know the, the lions there. So God's spirit does not make people drunk. That's a lie. That's a different spirit. And people receive that spirit. They want that. Whom we have not received or another gospel. And there's multitudes of other gospels out there which add works and labors and Different kinds of things to salvation, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. But the bottom line is, the way that the devil got to Eve is the same way he gets to everybody else. His methods do not change. So we, we attempt then to learn his methods, his, his modus operandi, the way that Satan works against people. Uh, we left off last Sunday night in Acts 26, 18. Bible said to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. So when you were in sin, Satan had power over you. You thought that you were ruling over your own life. You said, I'll do what I, I'll no preacher tell me what to do. I'll do my thing. I'll do it my way. It'll be my choice. But it wasn't. You were just doing exactly what the devil wanted you to do. He offered you sin. He offered you the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh. He offered you the pride of life. You jumped on it thinking that you were taking control of your life. But the problem is you were not in control. Devil was. He owned you. He had power over you. Christ delivered you from that power and that's what he says there. From the power of Satan and the God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So now turn to 1 Corinthians, if you would. 1 Corinthians, a couple verses in there, and then 2 Corinthians. I try to keep this in somewhat of an order so we can just go from one place to the next place and so on. 1 Corinthians 5. Let's get a little context of this verse. We're understanding how Satan works. Paul um, in 1 Corinthians 5 is dealing with an issue of fornication in the church. And what he says is you've got a man who's married his father's wife. 
which is gross. It's disgusting. And he said, you've got a man that's sleeping with his own father's wife and you're not doing anything about it. You're letting that happen. And he said, you're all puffed up over it. And so he says in verse 5, uh, well, let's back up to verse 4. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Paul's saying, I don't want this man to die and go to hell. But I do think he needs to learn a lesson. So Paul said, let's turn him over and let the devil have him. And when the devil gets a hold of it, have you ever seen a, a wolf or a lion or a leopard steal a little bitty fawn from like a herd of antelope or something like that? Have you ever seen that? They'll play with them for a while. It's, it's funny because when they steal these little newborn fawns from these deer herds, the leopard will kind of play around with it for a while. Won't just kill it all at once. And then all of a sudden, chomp! Got him. Kills him. So here's what this verse is telling you. If God allows it, if God allows it, Satan has power over your physical body. Does he not? Job. Satan went to Job after, after Satan said, okay, let me, let me have everything that belongs to Job. God said, you can have everything that belongs to Job. Don't touch Job. That was the first time. Second time, he says, let me afflict Job. God says to Satan, you can afflict Job, you can afflict his body, but you are not allowed to kill him. And I want you to think about this in your mind. Because there are guys like Kenneth Copeland and these other wackos going around telling everybody that Satan has more power on this earth than God does. And that you have to release God to do something to intervene or God can't do anything. That's stupid. It's nonsense. God physically restrained Satan. He said, you can afflict his body, but you can't kill him. And the devil, I mean, let me ask you a question. What do you think God would do to the devil if he disobeyed God and went ahead and killed Job? What do you think would happen? Huh? He would cast him into the pit. Right then and there. No ifs, ands, or buts. Cast him into the lake of fire. Cast him into the bottomless pit. He's going to do that anyway. And all the devils know that. That's why when Jesus, uh, when, he, when he met the man who called himself Legion, for we are many, those devils asked Jesus, don't, don't throw us into the pit now. Send us into that herd of swine over there. So Jesus did that. They knew that at some point Jesus has the power to cast them down in the bottomless pit. And they don't want to go there. So the devil then was restrained from actually killing Job. But he had the power to do it. And we find out that Satan does have the power of death. He has the power to kill. He has the power to take someone's life if God allows it. So this is what Paul's saying. I'm going to deliver this guy over to Satan, have him destroy his flesh so that we can save his soul. I'm going to have, I'm going to have the devil teach him a lesson, in other words. I'm going to turn him over a little bit under cruel authority and let the devil have him for a while so we can save the man's soul. Now, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 5. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time. This is talking about married couples. That you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Now, just very quickly, and I'll give you the, the PG version of that. Husbands and wives are given liberty and freedom by God to share romance between one another. 
But the Apostle Paul said, if both of you want to spend time fasting and praying and spending time with God, there's nothing wrong with that. However, withhold not yourselves one from another. God designed us as human beings, both male and female, to have a desire for romance, marital romance. And so God said through the Apostle Paul, we we'll spend time fasting and praying, that's fine, but don't take too long in it. Pay attention to your wife, pay attention to your husband, so that Satan doesn't tempt you for your incontinency. In other words, husbands and wives, you are to share yourselves one with another to keep each other from wandering out of the marriage. That's what he's saying. And Satan is the one who's leading men and women. I know somebody. I know somebody who uses their cell phone to constantly look for romance partners nearly every day. Constantly in and out of other people's beds. And this person's married. But they gave up on their spouse a long time ago and would rather be in and out of romantic interludes with other people almost every day. That's wicked. But that's what Satan desires to get people into. And it happens a lot in this world. You see, the internet and the power of the internet and these phones and these apps have made this not only possible, it's always been possible, but it's made it easier than it ever has been before. Uh, who was it? One of the Duggar boys. The Duggar family with all those kids. The oldest son. Somebody hacked into one of these dating websites. Stole their database and found his name and the number of times he had used that dating interface to hook up with a bunch of other women. He got caught in it. You know why? Be sure your sin will find you out. If God loves you, God will let you get caught. Right? And if God doesn't care, He'll let you get away with it. Because you might ask, how come God lets these people get away with all this stuff? Because God knows they are never going to turn their heart toward God. They're never going to do it. Meanwhile, if somebody who says they're a Christian gets caught up in that, I guarantee you God will, God will nail them with it. Expose them, humiliate them, to humble them, to cause them to repent. Happens all the time. Happens all the time, people. Uh, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 11. I'd like for you to underline this verse in your Bible. This is a good verse. So that one day you'll be thumbing through your Bible and you'll see this verse. 2 Corinthians 2, 11. So I want us to get sort of the context of this verse. 2 Corinthians 2. Um, Paul says, let's go to verse 9. For, this, for to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you whether you be obedient in all things, to whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For I, if I forgive anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes, forgave it I, or forgave I it, in the person of Christ. Lest, 
Satan should get an advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his what? That's what these are. They're devices. And there's a lot of other too. But we're not ignorant of his methods. We're not ignorant of how he works. Everybody, everybody in here and those of you watching online, everybody, the devil has a set of devices that he tries to work against you. He knows you. He's lived a lot longer than you've lived. The person that he harassed before you, he's, he's figured out how to do things. So when you come along and the devil comes after you, he knows what he's doing. He's been doing this for thousands of years. And he has devices that he uses against people to try to gain advantage over them including church people i would say especially church people i mean he's already got all the lost people he's already got that army the army he's afraid of is the army of the saints that's the one he's worried about so in his mind if i can if i can destroy the army of the saints of god then I will win and I will be able to achieve what it is my goal. And we're going to see his goal in a little bit. It's, it's written in scripture. What he actually wants. Him going and targeting you and working against you is not his number one goal. His number one goal is something else. But you are standing in the way of that. And good for you. Good job for standing in his way. Don't let him do it. Amen. God will use us that way. But let's not be ignorant of his devices. Let's learn how the devil works against us. That comes with wisdom, that comes with age, that comes with experience, that comes with Bible reading. The more you read the scriptures, the more you understand the scriptures, the more you understand the scriptures, the more you see the devil coming from a farther distance, the higher you get. I mean, what good does it do to have a watchman who's sitting down on the ground? He's not much of a watchman. He can't see much. Put him on a high tower so he can see miles out in the distance and be able to warn everybody from the furthest point possible. I see the devil. He's about 20 miles away. He's coming. We got us, we got us about, I don't know, four or five hours before he gets here, but he's, I'm telling you, he's coming. And to be able to see him from the farthest point possible to, under, to understand his devices and not be ignorant of how the devil works. I, if Brother Roy was here, he would pop his head in here because I would talk about him. But Roy is one of those that he learned years ago that one of Satan's devices was a bottle of Jack Daniels. That was his method of destroying Roy and Roy's marriage to Bonnie. So all he had to do was offer Roy a drink and Roy would take it. That was his device. Roy then became familiar with that, began to work against that. Had Bonnie go around pouring out all of the hidden bottles that he had. And then one day, several years later, he found another one <laughs> that he forgot about. He poured it out himself. You know why? Because he said, that's Satan's device. I'm not, I'm not doing it. I've been sober now 15 years. It's been hid that long. I'm, I've been sober now 15 years. There's no way in the world I'm going to put that to my lips. So he learned how the devil works against him. Learn that. Because you'll be able to fight him off better. Uh, second, turn to 2 Corinthians. Chapter 11. That's where we were a while ago when I... Where Paul's warning us about another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel. And the Apostle Paul then mentions, let's go to um, verse 13 of 2 Corinthians 11. For such are false apostles, um, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. 
one aspect of what this means is, is the Roman Catholic papacy. The Catholic papacy, that Pope believes he is the successor of Peter the Apostle. And that he has all divine authority and what he says goes. If he tells everybody they have to jump three times a day in order to please God, then if you're a Catholic, you got to jump three times a day. If he says that you have to pray to Mary, then you have to pray to Mary. He's the one that issues out. And doesn't matter if they contradict the Bible. He's the Pope. He is in the place of Jesus Christ here on this earth. That's what they teach. So that's what, that's part of what that means. They transform themselves. They tell everybody, I am the apostle of Christ, but they're not. Verse 14, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. He appears as the light. Now, th get, let's, think, let's think, think about this. We have the true light, which is Jesus Christ. Then we have Satan transforming himself into an angel of light. So, which one will you follow? Which one? So here's what I've been saying now for a long time. If your heart is dedicated to this book, and your soul belongs to God, I promise you, God will not let you follow the wrong light. I promise you, you won't. There, I don't know how it's going to look. I don't know what it's going to look like. But I think God's people are going to go, that is not Jesus. That's not him. That's not my savior. I've been listening to him talk. I know my shepherd's voice and that is not my shepherd's voice. And I know that that's not the light that I follow. So I just think God's people will know. The more your heart dedicated to this book, and you don't have to be smart. You don't have to have a PhD. You don't need a doctorate. You don't need to be some whiz at the Bible. All you got to do is believe it. The Holy Ghost in you will be the smart part. Amen? So he's transformed. Satan has the ability to transform himself into an angel of light and thereby deceive many. Deceive many people into believing that they're following the light of God, but they're not, they're following Satan. If you look in chapter 12, 2 Corinthians, boy, here's where it gets home here. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul in... Um, Verse 6, he's talking about how he could glory because, and I, I kind of taught this in Sunday school here a while back, Satan, or excuse me, Paul, for 14 years was given revelations directly from Jesus Christ himself. And so Paul had these doctrines in him to teach everybody. God used, I mean, look at your New Testament. 27 books in the New Testament. 14 of them were written by the Apostle Paul. The, the greatest single writer of the New Testament was the Apostle Paul. So Paul, Paul's old, back, his old life back as a Jew, he was very pompous and arrogant and full of pride. So now that he's following Christ and God's given him all these revelations... His, his wicked nature is still to be proud and say, look at me, I've got the revelations of God. Look at me, I'm important, I'm somebody big, I'm some big hot shot, I'm above everybody, I'm something else. That was his nature. But God did him a favor, as he has done you a favor. So he says in verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations... 
There was given unto me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So a couple things here. Number one, Satan has his own group of devils that do what he tells them to do. Who in here believes, you firmly believe that you have a thorn in your flesh given to you by God and you know what it is? Raise your hand. I do. And you all, you all do. Learn, figure out what it is. And you'll ask God to take it away from you. Some sort of sin or some sort of pride or whatever. You'll ask God to take it away from you and God will say, no, I'm going to leave it there. And I'm going to use that to keep you humble. I'm going to use that to keep you on your knees. But I'll give you grace. No matter what. And so, here's Satan now, who sends out a devil to Lindsay. Because you raised your hand, right, Lindsay? Now, I'm her dad. Lindsay hasn't told her dad what her thorn is. I don't want her to. That's between her and God. But Satan dispatched a devil to her to buffet her. And that's what it feels like, doesn't it? And Lindsay says, God, take this away from me. And God says, Lindsay, I'm going to leave it there. But I promise you, I'll give you grace. Because where you're weak, that's where I'm strong. And where you can't do, that's where I can do and will do. So Satan then sends out devils. Sends them out to me. Sends them to my wife. To my children. To people in this church. Sends them out to buffet them. And that's what that means. Pow. Pow. And maybe, maybe it is a sin. Maybe it is. And you've asked God to take it from you. And God hasn't said no. But what God has said is. I'll give you better than that. I'll give you grace. So, I want you to get this in your mind now. God is now using Satan for his glory and his purpose. Satan doesn't know it. He doesn't understand it. But God is using him to bring glory. Because every time you get buffeted, you cry to God. God has mercy and compassion on you and love for you. And he gives you grace. And then you just say, God, not my will, but thine be done. And God is strong in you. And that's how God, that's how God does it. So, as mean and as rotten and powerful as Satan is, God is more powerful than him way more powerful so if you keep reading there verse 8 for this saying i besought the lord thrice that it might depart from me and he said unto me my grace is sufficient for thee for my strength is made perfect in weakness most gladly therefore will i rather glory in my infirmities that the power of christ may rest upon me therefore i take pleasure in infirmities in reproaches in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. So God weakened me 
so he could use me. Mike, you're too full of yourself. You're too strong. Yeah, I have no use for you. And I, I should, God should have threw me out, but he didn't. So he sent a messenger of Satan to buffet me, to bring me down, to where I'd cry out to God and let God work through me in my weakness. 1 Thessalonians 2.18, Wherefore we would have come unto you. Look at this one. Therefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Satan has the power to hinder each and every one of us, to stop us. That, and I, I found that verse, Alicia, the day that we got turned away at the airport. You know, I've always told people, we go to Kenya from time to time, and people say, Pastor, it's dangerous over there, there's Ebola in Africa, and we don't want you to die, and all this stuff. And I always tell people, look, if God wants me in Kenya, I wake up one day and I'm in Kenya. If God doesn't want me in Kenya, I wake up in my own bed. So one day, we and me and Lisa and Alicia and her kids, Michael is already out there in Kenya. We, we're at the airport getting, getting our tickets to go to Kenya. And we got stopped right at Lambert International Airport. Lindsay was already all the way almost home. She took us, dropped us off. By the time we figured out we wasn't going, we had to call Lindsay. Lindsay, turn around and come back and pick us up. Because something with the kids' visas or their passports was out of order. Something was wrong with it. Now, I'm going to get into all that. But, and they said, the kids will never make it out of the country. You'll never be able to get them out of the country. So Alicia said, Dad, you go. You need to go. And I said, I'm not going again without my wife. Because the last trip I had was, it was hard on me. I, I needed my wife there. And so I said, I'm not going and leaving my wife here again. I, I'm not going to do that. And so we left the airport. And about three hours later... We're driving around Festus, and I hit the steering wheel like that. And Lisa, I was mad. Lisa said, what? I said, I just remembered that some pastors where we have our radio station were traveling all the way to meet me, to give me a gift. I'm supposed to be there to get that gift. Had I, Tammy, had I thought that thought while I was at the airport, I would have got on the plane and went to Kenya. But God did not let me think it until the plane already left, and it was too late. And I, I wondered at that. I said, God, why, why? Why won't you let, why wouldn't you let me go to Kenya? What's wrong with me go to Kenya? And this verse came to my mind, 1 Thessalonians 2, 18. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. The Apostle Paul, the greatest missionary, the greatest evangelist, the greatest Christian, the greatest preacher, the greatest gospel writer, the greatest one of us ever. And Satan hindered him. Who am I? And who are you? God will allow Satan to stop you from doing something good. And you may not understand it. But God does. Now I don't to this day don't know why I wasn't supposed to be in Kenya at that time. I have no idea why I wasn't supposed to be out there. But it just wasn't. For me to be out there. And God said no. Period. He does have the ability to hinder us. I'll, let me ask you this question. Have you ever had a hard time praying? Where you're trying to pray and all of a sudden your mind is out mowing the grass. Or your mind is thinking about a TV show. Or your mind is talking to family members. Or your mind is in a million different places. You ever had that happen? You ever been trying to read your Bible? Read three chapters and then stop and you go, I have no idea what I just read. You ever done that? Satan has the ability to hinder. But he doesn't have the ability to stop us altogether. You know what I'm saying? 
He can stand in your way temporarily. But he can't keep you out of heaven. He does not have that ability. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, turn there. We'll, we'll uh, close with this. This is a big, this, 2 Thessalonians 2 is a big teaching. So let's spend a little time with this. 2 Thessalonians 2. Let's look at the context of it. Um, look at verse 2. Be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, is that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. And he means exactly that. Don't be deceived by radio programs. Don't be deceived by books in a Christian bookstore. Don't be deceived by internet YouTube preachers. Don't be deceived by YouTube videos. Don't be deceived by blogs. Don't be deceived by false Bibles. Don't be deceived by any means at all. For that day shall not come. And he's talking about in verse 1, the gathering of us together to Jesus, which is the rapture. He said, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So the Antichrist is the man of sin. And I want you to think about that. Christ is the son of righteousness. Antichrist is the man of sin. Christ is full of righteousness and holiness. The beast, the Antichrist, is full of wickedness. He is total wickedness. The sum, you could say, if you collected all of the sins of all of mankind for all of human history and mashed it together like putty and built a man, that's who the Antichrist would be. He is the man of sin. He's the son of perdition. Perdition is hell. He's a child of hell. That's who he is. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. Jesus is called God. The Holy Spirit is called God. The Father is called God. The Word is God. So he, he's exalted above everything, including the Bible. Or that is worshipped. So that he is God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He wants everybody to look at him and make them believe that they are worshiping God, but it's not God. It's a fake God, not the real one. How do you tell the difference? With one of them yellow pens they have at the grocery store. Right? Get one of those yellow pins and mark a $20 bill. Okay, that's a $20 bill. No, you tell the difference because you believe this book. This book correctly identifies and will fill your mind with the difference between Christ and the fake Christ. It's like somebody who studies art and is a master at spotting Art forgeries. They study Renoir and Da Vinci and Michelangelo and other, the other Ninja Turtle painters. They study these people and they learn their styles and their brush strokes. And so here comes a forgery and a trained eye can look at that and say, that's a fake. That's a forgery. Or somebody who knows how people write their names and sign their names can spot a forgery in a court of law. They're professionals. They're hired to do that. You and only you, meaning God's people, will be the only ones who will be able to tell the difference between the real Jesus and the fake. Everybody else is going to fall for the fake. Everybody is. So he says then in verse 5, Remember not that when I was with yet with you I told you these things, and now you know what withhold it, that he might be revealed in his time, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. See that it's being worked on right now. Bringing the Antichrist in, that process has already begun. 
Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then, verse 8, shall that wicked, capital W, be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, which is the Bible, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Verse 9 is what I have up on the screen. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So something to remember about Satan's, what he does and why he does. This is getting into what his agenda is. We're learning what he does, but why is he doing it? We know from Revelation 13, Revelation 13 says, John says, I saw beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, ten crowns upon his horns. And the beast I saw was like unto a lion and a leopard and a bear. And the dragon gave him his power, his seat and great authority. The dragon there is Satan. So we know that Satan's, all of Satan's work everywhere is to accomplish the rising up of the Antichrist. Everything he's doing, every lie that people are telling, every dirty joke that you hear on television, every wicked image that you might see, every murder, every act of fraud, every sin in the world inspired by Satan to bring about this one person on the earth to sit in the seat of God himself, the Antichrist. That's why Satan does what he does. Is to enthrone the man of sin where God sits. To put him there that's why he's doing what he's doing so he works on a small scale like on us in this little church but he also works on a grand scale in governments high and mighty people bankers industrialists actors famous people athletes groups like the council on foreign relations the bilderberg group um mystical secret societies that meet. All of that on a grand scale is designed to do this one thing, and that is bring about the man of sin so that everybody worships him as God, but he's not God. That's the plan. And he uses big, and he uses small. He wants everybody in a total Absolute, total domination and control of everything in the world is what he wants. God will let him have it for a little space. Amen. Uh, so next week we'll get into like Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, where it actually describes a little bit more about Lucifer, what he looks like, how he was designed and so on. All right, let's stand to our feet tonight.